do have. Okay, okay. Very good. Uh, Olga, thank you very much for the invitation, you and the organizing committee. It is a great privilege for me to give talks at my alma mater. I graduated from St. Petersburg State University and got my Kandidatska uh, degree from this institution and even managed to teach for a few years in the Department of Phonetics. And I also uh, wanted to, um, this, these are nostalgic times, difficult times for everybody and uh, for us uh, older people, nostalgic times. I'm uh, thinking a lot about my advisor, uh, uh, Lydia Vasilyevna Bandarka, uh, who was my advisor and the chair of the Department of Phonetics and my other mentors in, in the department. Uh, they uh, taught me the greatest lesson of all uh, the lessons I um, learned uh, in my lifetime. Uh, always use common sense. And if something uh, is against your common sense, uh, try to figure out where the problem is. But, uh, and maybe you have to adjust your common sense, but very often, uh, um, you know, there are issues with the, with the data, with the observations, and you need to adjust them. Uh, anyway, uh, so um, I will jump right in uh, and just to double check. Uh, can you see my mouse moving? Yes, everything works perfectly. We can okay. hear, we can see everything on your screen. Okay, okay wonderful. So uh, if I point to something, uh, you will see that. Alrighty, so uh, let's move on. Uh, and uh, um, here, my screen, okay, now it's moving. It's a little bit slow. Uh, always panic. panic. Uh, you know, we are get, we're becoming zombies and <laughs> Uh, whatever platform we're using uh, and, uh, um, you know, developing different patterns of behavior. Uh, very unusual in face-to-face uh, -face, uh, interactions. So, uh, fuzzy lexical representations is uh, my uh, kind of uh, uh, pet peeve, if you want, my favorite topic uh, since a few years now, a bunch of years now. Uh, and uh, most of my talk will be um, devoted to uh, showing you evidence in support of different aspects of uh, 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 fuzzy lexical representations. But what I will also try to do is uh, to look around and look at other approaches to uh, word recognition and word um, processing in a non-native language. And instead of just pushing for one direction to try uh, to kind of situate it in a larger context. And with this in mind, uh, I will um, pitch uh, fuzzy lexical representations against a different but very similar account, the lexical entrenchment account. Uh, and mainly the uh, contrast will be between the fuzzy lexical representations account and a memory-based approach uh, represented by the episodic L2 hypothesis. Uh, and to, um, to jump right in and to give everybody an invitation on behalf of our uh, editors team, uh, one of uh, um, the uh, members of the team, uh, Anna Krabush, is present uh, here. Uh, we are uh, running a, a research topic, fuzzy lexical representations in the non-native uh, um, lexicon uh, uh, at uh, Frontiers. Uh, two journals um, um, participate, Frontiers in Psychology and Frontiers in Communications. Uh, what uh, I'm very excited about is that the invitation to uh, run this research topic came from uh, Frontiers, from uh, um, 
the editorial board, uh, uh, apparently. Uh, and for us, that was a sign that the word fuzzy is uh, kind of uh, um, becoming more and more prominent in, uh, in uh, uh, the literature and in the minds of people who deal with uh, non-native uh, language processing. So uh, this, uh, uh, our team includes uh, uh, five uh, editors, uh, two uh, mm, scholars working uh, mostly, uh, not um, only, but mostly on the Russian agenda, Anna Krabosh and Svetlana Cook, and uh, two colleagues from Germany, Denisa Bordek and Andreas Opitz, um, who uh, are bringing a very important dimension of um, uh, fuzziness in, uh, in the semantic representations or the, in the semantic side of lexical representations to this project. So uh, we have uh, a big description of what we are doing. And just to alert you to the first deadline, uh, November 30th, uh, is the deadline for the abstracts. It could be uh, extended uh, uh, if somebody asks for an extension, but just to give you a timeline. So we are hoping that uh, we will see uh, a, a set of very, very interesting publications. Uh, uh, quite a few people have already uh, indicated interest. So uh, to, uh, and here, here I am uh, struggling with the, my screen covered by, okay, I'm, I'm hiding everybody's faces. Um, so to begin with, let's um, kind of define our space. What do we refer to when uh, uh, we uh, talk about fuzzy lexical representations? And this is, uh, um, uh, kind of a working definition, uh, again, from, from the website. Uh, the L2 lexicon contains less robust or fuzzy lexical representations that are not properly encoded. A fuzzy lexical representation is characterized by a large degree of uncertainty and ambiguity and has less distinct vague boundaries that differentiate it from the neighboring representations. The fuzziness of lexical representations can manifest itself at the level of phonological or orthographic encoding, at the level of word meaning, or as loose fu fuzzy for meaning associations. How do second language speakers learn and process uh, L2 words? And here again, uh, I'm emphasizing that I'm going to pitch uh, our account that I think uh, has uh, uh, got sufficient traction uh, and that uh, is becoming more and more established in the literature uh, against uh, the uh, memory-based approach, the episodic L2 hypothesis uh, that is uh, explored by uh, my a uh, colleague in the department, Nanjiang, uh, we are a small uh, program and, uh, you know, we uh, have a nice space to fight, <laughs> um, uh, of course, intellectually. Um, so um, here is kind of an alternative approach. And so far, uh, no bridges have been made. And this is a talk where uh, I will um, do a little bit of hand waving and speculation and try to build some bridges uh, with the, um, between our approach and some other approaches. And of course, the lexical entrenchment account uh, that um, is um, mostly based on research on uh, uh, the role of uh, lexical frequency in uh, L2 word recognition. And it focuses on uh, the activation level uh, as a, an, uh, an explanatory uh, uh, mechanism uh, uh, behind uh, the effects, plus uh, the precision of uh, representations. Uh, we uh, are more interested in uh, uh, the quality of 
the encoding of the um, lexical representation, different aspects of encoding. And for us, the familiarity level with, with, the, with the lexical unit uh, is um, the core uh, underlying construct. Uh, at the same time, uh, I personally think that familiarity uh, is uh, highly correlated with subjective lexical frequency and my uh, colleague, uh, Lana Cooks, uh, uh, shares uh, this uh, point of view. And there is something else at the periphery, if you want, and this is the lexical quality hypothesis that was developed for L1 reading, but it is, uh, it's, uh, uh, tenets are very, very close to what we are doing. So as much as we are working in parallel spaces, uh, indeed, we are not. We are uh, uh, exploring uh, the same aspect of uh, um, uh, lexical representations, and this is the quality of encoding, if you want. So to uh, give you a, li uh, a little visual, uh, here is this cluster of uh, um, approaches to um, uh, uh, language uh, processing and uh, language encoding uh, with the, our fuzzy lexical representations in L2 as, uh, uh, as a centerpiece, of course, but also lexical entrenchment and lexical quality hypotheses out there that uh, uh, overlap with, uh, with the fuzzy lexical representations approach. And then there is this episodic L2 hypothesis. And uh, uh, as uh, we will see, um, uh, at the offset, they are pitched one against the other. But whether this is really true, it will be for us to discover. So uh, my, the first part of my talk will uh, focus on uh, the evidence that is out there in the literature uh, regarding different aspects with fuzzy uh, lexical representations. And we will start uh, um, at the very beginning where it all started with the fuzziness resulting from uh, uh, L2 learners dealing with problematic phonological contrasts in L2 uh, that uh, make uh, 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 lexical uh, encoding very difficult, but also uh, perceptual processing, uh, which is uh, at the, uh, uh, which is the source of those encoding difficulties, uh, very problematic for uh, L2 learners. Uh, and then uh, we'll uh, look at uh, our uh, evidence uh, supporting uh, the fact that fuzzy phonolexical representations uh, can uh, arise in second language learners, uh, even when uh, there are no particular uh, uh, perceptual difficulties involved, no difficult contrast. But, uh, um, uh, and this is um, a, an, an interesting uh, extension of the very uh, kind of intuitive and transparent idea if you uh, cannot uh, encode uh, uh, the phonemes, then uh, you will have uh, problems with encoding the word. So you, uh, uh, the, the next step is to say, well, actually, uh, even if I hear a, an English t as a Russian native speaker, if I hear a Rus uh, an English t as a t and an n as an n and so on and so forth, I can still, uh, have problems with encoding the words in my mental lexicon. Uh, and the, uh, we will look at the evidence uh, in support of that point of view. But then uh, the fun part comes uh, when you talk about fuzzy for meaning mappings. And uh, uh, I will show you uh, um, a couple of uh, studies that um, come from our research group. Uh, and then uh, the, um, and maybe if I have the time, 
an interesting uh, study on semantic relatedness that uses the visual domain, but of course uh, uh, is pitched uh, to, to deal with the uh, problems in the auditory domain. And then uh, there is this um, kind of simplistic approach in uh, uh, dealing with the uh, four meaning mappings in, uh, in a one-to-one -one relationship. Here is your form, here is your meaning, uh, here is your uh, uh, um, association of the form and, and the meaning. It can be strong, weak, and so on. But then uh, we also know that word meanings, uh, uh, words usually have multiple meanings. And uh, it is not always easy to discover a word's meaning if it is not very transparent. If it is not a picture of an apple, uh, it may be a picture of something that you have never seen before. So you, you have to encode uh, the concept or maybe you have to uh, figure out the meaning of the word from the context and what happens with the semantic encoding at those initial stages. So, um, because I don't have a timer on my screen. I'm going a little bit slower, but I will speed up. Uh, so let us start uh, with the very beginning. And uh, uh, please forgive me, I will rush a little bit through the data that uh, are widely known just to set the stage uh, to focus more on uh, two uh, studies uh, that come uh, from um, um, my 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 group and that are very recent we're writing them up but they haven't been published yet and they 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 are kind of um, at least uh, in my view they they are fun to talk about so let us rush a little bit through the background uh, the first uh, seminal study to show that difficult uh, uh, l2 phonemic contrasts leads to unfaithful phonological encoding uh, was this study by Pallier and colleagues who used medium lag phonological priming and they compared uh, the performance of uh, uh, Spanish Catalan um, bilinguals with Catalan as a dominant language and with Spanish as a dominant language. And there are several uh, contrasts in uh, Catalan such as a, a uh, uh, two different O's, S, Z, that uh, uh, do not exist in the Spanish. And then they also use some co common contrasts. And uh, what they um, observed was uh, uh, something that they uh, actually uh, were hoping to find, and they did find it. Uh, they, uh, uh, they relied on the repetition effect in a medium leg identity priming. In other words, if you uh, give people a sequence of words uh, and uh, one word gets repeated uh, um, after uh, uh, several intervening stimuli, uh, maybe up to 20. Uh, uh, there are still strong traces of uh, mm, uh, the retrieval of the first uh, of, uh, of the word at the first encounter. And therefore, um, mm, the second uh, retrieval will go faster. So this repetition effect is speeding up on the second encounter. Uh, but in order to, uh, uh, for this um, repetition effect uh, to happen, you need two identical words. So what happens if the words are not identical, but they're minimal pairs and they are contrasted by uh, a, a phonological um, pair? Uh, opposition that exists in Catalan, but not in Spanish. So let's look at uh, the two um, upper panels. The uh, panel B on the right is where 
um, um, you have Catalan and Spanish dominant uh, bilinguals uh, performing on the contrasts that exist in both languages and you see the predicted effect. So uh, this repetition effect uh, is uh, present for the uh, words that are really identical and it is absent for the words that are minimal pairs. But if you look uh, uh, at the left hand A panel, you see a different pattern for Catalan uh, words, uh, uh, for, uh, for the words uh, that are contrasted by the Catalan uh, uh, um, vowel and consonant uh, pairs. Uh, you see that uh, Catalan uh, dominant bilinguals show the same effect. Um, they are speeded up by the identical word, but not by its minimal pair. But this is not what happens in um, Spanish dominant bilinguals. They uh, are um, getting, uh, getting caught uh, uh, by, uh, by this uh, design, and uh, apparently they they cannot tell the difference between the two words, and they think they heard the same words, so they get the speed up, they get faster, but for the wrong reason. So that was. Don't like the way it doesn't move when I want it to move. So uh, there, there have been several, uh, if you want, replications or uh, studies that use the same design uh, uh, with the uh, uh, Spanish learners of English, uh, English learners of French, uh, uh, learners of German, uh, Japanese. Uh, so this is a very robust finding. Uh, and so from there, we are moving on. Uh, we can talk about it um, in, uh, in the discussion if you want, uh, but uh, there, are, there is so much evidence that indeed a difficult, a perceptually difficult contrast uh, leads to uh, problems with the lexical encoding that it is almost trivial. So let us look at the same uh, phenomenon of uh, lexical encoding, but then go to the next step when it is not about a difficult uh, contrast. And here we need uh, to go to a different paradigm. Uh, and uh, this, uh, well, actually, no, I'm um, sorry, I'm taking it back. We're still with the, with the phonological contrast, but we're moving to a different paradigm. Uh, uh, lexical competition. And of course, uh, we are working uh, under the assumption that uh, when um, uh, 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 in word recognition, uh, uh, we go through several stages, uh, we activate uh, the potential candidate, but also uh, uh, all the lexical entries compatible with the auditory input. And according to, um, this is based on the cohort uh, theory by uh, Marlson Wilson. And then uh, when several uh, candidates are activated, uh, uh, there is a competition for selection. And then uh, finally the selection of the best matching candidate. Uh, so, uh, again, the seminal st study is uh, we're now moving into um, the eye tracking, uh, visual world eye tracking uh, uh, domain. And uh, um, the seminal study there is the one by Weber and Cutler uh, when uh, uh, Dutch uh, uh, speakers of English were dealing with English words and uh, uh, objects on on this um, on their display, and they were getting instructions: uh, click on the panda, uh, move the panda to the circle. And uh, of course, when there was a uh, distractor a pencil uh, in the display, they kept looking to the panda and to the pencil uh, for some time. 
uh, and uh, uh, finally uh, they um, uh, started to uh, uh, shift their looks completely uh, to to the uh, target word panda as opposed to pencil uh, because the word uh, coda resolves uh, a, 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 these are not minimal pairs uh, the word codas are different and uh, all the ambiguity is resolved at the end of the word so uh, here again um, uh, what you can observe is um, the hesitancy, the procrastination of non-native speakers in uh, uh, zooming in uh, on the target and uh, um, in stopping uh, to look at uh, the distractor. So on the uh, right uh, hand panel, you see uh, speakers of British English by uh, uh, 350 milliseconds, roughly, they stop looking at the panda. They uh, at the pencil. I'm sorry. They look at panda. Uh, 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 while uh, on the left hand side, uh, the Dutch uh, speakers of English take 500 milliseconds to resolve this ambiguity. And interestingly enough, uh, unlike uh, Pali and colleagues. Uh, uh, um, Weber and Cutler and uh, uh, many studies that followed show uh, typically show an asymmetry. One uh, phonological category is do dominant and this, this percolates uh, to the encoding level. So when uh, the, those same participants were given pencil as the target and panda as the competitor, they quickly resolved uh, this initial ambiguity uh, at 250 milliseconds. And the same was done with uh, mm, uh, a different set of uh, languages and, diff uh, and a different contrast, the LR contrast in Japanese. Uh, so uh, here you have uh, rocket and locker uh, in the display. And again, uh, there is uh, lexical competition uh, driven by um, a very legitimate cause. Um, initially, there is indeed ambiguity, only it should uh, be resolved uh, when uh, um, well, in this case, actually, <laughs> I'm taking it back. In this case, uh, there is very few room, uh, uh, very little room for uh, ambiguity initially because it is the initial segment L versus R. Uh, only uh, as far as I remember, this is not consistent um, uh, in all of the materials in this study. So uh, in this particular example, it is easy to resolve ambiguity and still um, uh, native speakers of Japanese take uh, 600 uh, milliseconds to do it when it goes in one direction from rocket to locker. When the um, target is locker, uh, they go much faster. And of course, uh, there are reasons out there that are being discussed. Okay, so now uh, we are uh, going to uh, move to a vocabulary training uh, study. And uh, I'm going to present to you as I promised uh, a pretty um, recent study uh, that uh, uh, was conducted by my advisee, Chi Zheng. Uh, and just to set you up, uh, uh, I wanted to alert you, those of you who haven't done language training studies, especially with second language learners, this is quite an endeavor, uh, uh, logistically and in terms of the design. And there are so many decisions to be made. And just to give you an example of uh, an earlier study, uh, again, uh, one of the studies that uh, um, paved the road to language 
vocabulary training studies exploring the encoding of difficult contrast. This one al also deals with the, the a, a contrast in English that's problematic for Dutch learners. Uh, they use uh, non-objects and non-words to uh, uh, during training. And this is a, a big decision because um, um, as uh, has been shown, uh, and uh, um, it stands to, uh, you know, to reason as well, uh, it is not very easy to encode uh, new concepts, new, um, you know, non-objects um, needs to be somehow encoded uh, in addition uh, to encoding the form. Uh, so um, uh, this is just to show you that we went for a different um, kind of uh, decision uh, and none of them is uh, unproblematic. Each decision comes with, uh, with a set of complications. So uh, this is the study that I will uh, walk you through as fast as I can, but um, I will give you some um, details of it uh, because it deals with the, with the Sorry, I'm losing my mouse and I cannot move those things out of my way. Uh, the influence of native phonology, allophonic variation and phonotaxics on lexical encoding in a second language. And that was again a vocabulary training study. Um, so, um, let me whatever I do. My screen is covered. Um, so we uh, uh, did a pretty comprehensive study uh, that focused on uh, uh, Mandarin Chinese learners of English. And uh, we looked at their categorical perception at uh, the role of allophonic variation in uh, uh, their native language, the role of phonotactic constraints in their native language, uh, and uh, also at uh, memory consolidation, at sleep-related uh, consolidation. Uh, so we tested them on the day, day of the training and on uh, the next day to see what happens to those um, newly formed representations, whether they are being consolidated, whether uh, the encoding improves with sleep, or maybe if there were initial problems with encoding, it will not uh, improve with, with, with sleep. So the uh, English uh, uh, contrast um, uh, that we targeted uh, is the v, v uh, contrast, two different phonemes in English. In uh, Mandarin Chinese, there is one uh, phoneme And I'm wondering whether why it wouldn't move here. Um, so uh, in English, these are two different phonemes. In uh, uh, Chinese, uh, these are two allophones of the same uh, phoneme w. Uh, that is encoded as W in the Chinese romanization script. Uh, and the interesting uh, thing is that uh, W uh, remains the uh, dominant uh, allophone, but in some parts of uh, China, people use uh, 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 those two allophones interchangeably. And those, uh, the use of those elephones is subject to phonotactic constraints. So we used, um, we used uh, a, this critical cost. Hello? Somebody intruding on us? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, and I hope this was just by mistake. Someone probably. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm as paranoid as you are <laughs> about intruders. <laughs> um, so um, 
there was this target contrast and there was a control contrast, Kogo, which is supposed to be non-problematic. And uh, uh, we created uh, pseudo words, uh, disyllabic, not minimal pairs, um, uh, something like uh, uh, wiren, widem. So the codas are different. And uh, just to give you an idea uh, of uh, a nightmarish uh, logistical uh, puzzle that uh, people running those uh, language training studies in L2 uh, have to deal with, uh, I, uh, I just wanted to emphasize that working memory uh, was uh, uh, a working memory test battery was part of it. Uh, and AX discrimination part uh, uh, test was part of it. And what was also very important a, the, uh, there was a Chinese reading task included. Uh, in other words, we wanted to know which participants used which, uh, which elephones in their own native production. So we wanted to look at uh, um, the level of perceptual confusions for, uh, in the AX discrimination test. We were uh, uh, interested in uh, uh, those difficulties in uh, uh, the encoding of those contrasts uh, during lexicalization and specifically the role of elephonic variation and phonotactic constraints in the native language. And also, as I said, uh, sleep associated um, uh, memory consolidation. So we went for uh, real objects, but low frequency objects. And uh, again, uh, ask me questions during uh, the question and answer session. I won't uh, uh, deal with it now, but this is also problematic, of course, on a certain level. And we used two recordings of a male and a female. And uh, uh, what was done nicely, uh, those uh, pictures were randomly associated with the, uh, the names for each participant. So there was, uh, though we tried to um, calibrate the pictures, they were black and white drawings and so on and so forth. Uh, but it, uh, you know, they represented um, real objects, therefore um, they could be more or less salient for different people um, and therefore uh, just to avoid any uh, possible biases we did it uh, that way and so there was uh, an exit test uh, that um, where they self-tested and then uh, they received feedback uh, they, we wanted to make sure that uh, they uh, reached uh, a 90% uh, accuracy threshold. And then uh, there was a real test of uh, uh, lexical encoding. That was a lexical decision task that was run twice, uh, right after the training session and uh, the day after. And here, uh, the lures, the words uh, that uh, were confusable uh, with the with the target words with the words that they had learned uh, differed only in the initial uh, segment in the initial English phoneme w versus w uh, uh, sorry v versus w uh, v versus w and therefore the task was pretty difficult. Uh, to uh, say whether that was a real word or not a word. And I'm going to show you the results of uh, uh, for accuracy, but uh, uh, the, uh, the beauty of this study is that all the stats lined up. Uh, so uh, the uh, reaction time data is uh, um, uh, are also very robust and show the same significant effects just for, for the visuals. Let's look at uh, the results of the AX discrimination task. That's what went in, in terms of how uh, Chinese participants um, dealt with the contrast it itself. So the blue dots are for native controls and they are Call it ceiling. Um, the lowest is ninety-five percent accuracy. Um, uh, and for uh, Chinese learners, uh, those uh, orange dots 
um, the level of uh, accuracy varies, but uh, look at the scale, it does not go below 80%. They're, they're pretty good, but not as good as native speakers. Now, this is what we see uh, with, uh, in the results of the post-test and delayed post-test. And again, this is accuracy just uh, because it's uh, e you know, very easy to interpret. So you have the, uh, con uh, those two, set, uh, 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 two bars in a set. Uh, the solid color is for day one. And this kind of zebra color is for day two uh, for each condition. And you have English native speakers on the left and the Chinese learners on the right. And then you have um, the control contrast um, coded in bluish colors and the critical contrast is in uh, orange, yellow or red. And uh, so, uh, as you see, uh, there is not, not much uh, action going on in uh, um, the uh, Ke contrast. There is not, not, such, uh, not a huge difference between Chinese learners and native speakers. They are uh, around 80% accuracy. Uh, they are doing just fine. The same is true for the critical contrast for native speakers. Uh, but look at what is going on in, uh, uh, in uh, the uh, critical condition for Chinese learners. The uh, accuracy uh, of uh, encoding drops to 40% on the average, and uh, it um, I, I won't show you the details. It also uh, it is also statistically significant uh, for different um, phonotactic contexts. So uh, what you see here is uh, um, the analysis where we divided uh, the Chinese group into two subgroups based on their reading in Chinese because they turned out to be uh, uh, very um, easily dividable. Uh, one group used only uh, one, the W uh, mm, uh, uh, sound uh, to encode uh, uh, one, uh, the dominant category in Chinese. And the other group uh, used uh, uh, both elephones interchangeably. This is actually a very important caveat because we're not talking about the elephones that depend on, on the phonetic uh, position or context and that are in uh, uh, complementary distribution. This is free variation. And this is very important, but then still the result is quite of interesting. So what you see, number one, that the level of accuracy on those post deaths, uh, day one and day two have uh, similar um, uh, direction of the effect. But those who use only one elephone are doing much better than the ones uh, they are on, on the right in each uh, panel. Those who are using two elephones are doing less well, but also there is an asymmetry between how they are dealing with two types of lures, the V lure or the uh, W lure. And you see that the V lure is doing uh, even uh, less well uh, than the W lure. And uh, this um, has to do with the dominance of uh, the W category. Uh, so uh, uh, it is um, uh, much more difficult to uh, reject the V lure than the W lure. So quickly to the conclusions, because it looks like I'm, uh, I'm not going to cover the whole territory. I'll have to skip uh, a few steps uh, in order to get us where I want us to uh, uh, finish uh, this, uh, this talk. 
So we saw uh, indeed difficulties in uh, categorical perception and lexicalization. Uh, we saw asymmetric lexical access. Uh, uh, we also saw an interesting uh, phenomenon uh, um, that uh, elephonic variation and something that I forgot to mention, those elephones, uh, the V and W elephones in Chinese are phonetically very similar to the phonemes in English. Uh, so whenever speakers use two elephones interchangeably in the L1, uh, there was uh, um, more interference. And when they used only W, there was less interference from allophonic variation. And uh, again, uh, this is um, mirrored in, in uh, uh, the role of phonotactic constraints. Uh, but uh, um, the last point is very <clears throat> important. Uh, so what happened with the uh, memory consolidation? And I, I, I'm not showing you any graphs, but just believe me. Uh, indeed, uh, sleep-associated consolidation did take place in, in uh, both uh, native speakers and uh, L2 learners. But this magnitude of lexical facilitation uh, for the novel uh, L2 contrast was uh, much more limited in uh, L2 learners compared to the control condition and to native speakers. Uh, so I guess I will uh, skip over uh, a bunch of slides. And if you permit me, I will just uh, open the other view because given how quickly time goes, I won't get there. Uh, here is here is something that I really wanted us to look at. Uh, and this is an older study um, by uh, several um, researchers, graduate students in our program. Uh, and it is about how uh, fuzzy lexical representation, uh, fuzzy phonological representations, fuzzy form representations, uh, uh, leads to form to meaning mappings. And it's because it's uh, on Russian, um, uh, I hope you, you appreciate uh, the cleverness of this study. So it consisted of two experiments. Uh, the first was a translation judgment task. Uh, and it was a cross model task with uh, 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 an auditory Russian word uh, as a, uh, and a visual English translation. And this is how it was designed. Uh, it uh, used uh, real English translations uh, of the word. So uh, for the Russian word uh, malatok, uh, you would have hammer as an English translation. This is a correct translation. But it also used phonologically confusable words uh, as a potential translation. So you would have. Um, uh, Russian uh, malatok, but then the translation will be, uh, 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 sorry, you will have English uh, malatok, but the Russian uh, original word will be malako, milk. Uh, with uh, and uh, the amount of overlap uh, of phonological overlap between um, those words in the uh, competitor uh, mismatch condition and in the competitor match uh, condition uh, was measured using Levenstein uh, distance, uh, the Levenstein distance measure. Uh, and everybody knows what it is, right? It was developed in the 60s by a Russian uh, scholar, um, Vladimir Levenstein. And it, uh, it um, measures the distance between uh, two words uh, uh, in terms of the number of insertions, deletions, and substitutions. So it's a flexible measure. It's not just about uh, identifying neighbors, but how close two words are. 
So uh, let's look at the findings. Uh, you have uh, um, panel A for native controls, panel B for superior speakers of Russian, very advanced speakers of Russian with English as a native language, and C, advanced speakers of Russian. Pretty, you know, pretty good proficiency, but not superior. And you have uh, uh, also two frequency ranges. So for low frequency range, uh, which uh, is represented by um, blue symbols, nothing mu much happens, you know, as a function of Levenstein distance. But if you look at uh, the um, uh, position of those uh, competitor mismatch uh, black uh, filled circles, you see a very nice dynamic. Uh, so indeed in native speakers, uh, um, the reaction time increases when uh, two words uh, increases a little bit when two words are differentiated by a measure of one. Uh, so one substitution, one deletion and so on. Uh, but it is much, the effect is much greater for uh, superior speakers and uh, uh, for um, superior speakers and, sorry, and it is even greater uh, for the advanced speakers, uh, even, uh, uh, you know, uh, even uh, for um, two positions or uh, they have an enormous uh, increase in reaction times. And uh, the second, uh, and I think that will be the last um, piece of uh, um, empirical evidence that I will be able to show you before uh, we go into those muddy waters of discussion, discussing um, different approaches to um, word learning and word recognition in L2. This is the second part of the same study, pseudo-semantic priming. In, uh, it uses the same print. It uses the same principle. Uh, a potential for confusion between uh, molotok hammer and molako milk. Uh, when uh, the prime is cow. So in a, a real semantically related trial, cow should prime milk, uh, but will cow prime hammer? Uh, and the results uh, were um, a little bit um, unexpected because I guess uh, initially we applied a very straightforward you know, in, uh, in other words, primitive thinking. We were uh, thinking that our participants will be so confused that we'll, they will be just uh, um, facilitated by uh, the uh, false semantic relationship between cow and uh, hammer, and they will uh, speed up as they would uh, uh, with the, the pair uh, cow milk. But this is not what really happens. The opposite happened, but it was a very interesting effect. So again, you have native controls, the advanced group and the intermediate group, and you have two levels of frequency. Uh, only intermediate speakers didn't get low frequency items. They, they were just not within their lexical range. So they just did high frequency items. So what you see here is a very interesting dynamics. In native speakers, uh, those pseudo primes and control primes uh, didn't really differ in reaction times. Uh, whereas in, uh, um, ad in the advanced group, uh, you see this uh, inhibition in those trials where um, you see uh, in those trials where um, uh, there is a pseudo-semantic relationship between uh, the prime and the target, but they're still, uh, uh, but they're not showing anything uh, in the low frequency conditions. So it has to be super salient for them. And for intermediate speakers, again, you have this uh, very 
uh, significant uh, uh, slowdown um, inhibition for those pseudosemantic primes. Uh, so uh, again, I'm going to skip a very interesting mouse tracking study that I wanted to show you, but I don't think we have the time for that. Uh, okay. Uh, switching gears and going to uh, memory-based uh, episod episodic L2 hypothesis. It was developed uh, in uh, the framework of bilingual studies. And uh, I don't know how well people realize that uh, second language acquisition research and bilingual research uh, overlap in terms of the targeted populations. You know, second language learners uh, is a type of bilinguals, but uh, they uh, they differ in uh, their research foci because second language acquisition is interested in how uh, a second language is being learned or processed, uh, whereas bilingual studies, uh, all this rich literature on bilingualism, looks at how two languages uh, interact uh, with each other in in the bilingual's mind. Uh, so they include two languages. So the zodiac L2 uh, hypothesis um, uh, was uh, generated in those bilingual studies they, that looked at, uh, they, they mostly used masked uh, translation uh, uh, judgment uh, studies or uh, masked translation priming studies. In particular, this uh, study that led uh, to uh, the generation of this hypothesis, Jung and Forster, 2001, uh, used uh, a masked um, um, translation priming study uh, with L1 word uh, and uh, its translation in L2 and an L2 word and in uh, and its translation in L1 and found a, a very interesting um, pattern that uh, L2 words primed L1 words, but uh, uh, sorry, L1 words primed L2 words, but not the other way around. L2 words did not prime L1 words. And then they added a, uh, an episodic uh, memory task. And in that task, uh, uh, indeed, uh, L2, L2 primed L1. And uh, we need uh, to talk a little bit about uh, what uh, an episodic uh, memory task is, um, because not everybody may be very well acquainted with that. Uh, people get lists of words, and uh, uh, those words uh, will be their targets uh, in, 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 in testing. So they get a list of words, say uh, a, a Chinese speaker gets a list of Chinese words. Those will be the targets uh, in, in the experiment, but they don't know about it. They're just uh, told to learn this list. And then uh, in the episodic memory task, they will uh, encounter a masked uh, L2 uh, prime, that will be a prime in English, and then uh, they will be uh, asked to say whether the words they encounter was on the list or not. So is it an old word that they know just because they know it, or is it uh, a new word, or in other words, the word from the studied list. So it uh, is supposed to tap into a different type of memory, um, they are not making any lexical judgments about it. It's just whether they remember it or not. So what they uh, showed J uh, Jung and Forster that in those episodic memory tasks, uh, um, L2 uh, uh, could prime L1. So this masked L, uh, L2 prime, uh, which was a translation equivalent, uh, speeded up uh, uh, the responses of the L2 participants. Uh, 
Uh, however, the, there are many, uh, uh, many difficulties with the embracing this uh, approach because uh, indeed, uh, and uh, we'll uh, look at uh, the next two slides. I'm, uh, I'm, uh, Olga, you tell me when I have to really stop, stop, because I'm wrapping it up, but I need another maybe five minutes, if it is okay. Yes, that's definitely okay. Five minutes are fine. <laughs> okay, so um, um, I'm hoping I'll, I'll manage it. So uh, episodic memory is not uh, such, a, uh, such an appropriate, uh, you know, category to be used uh, in those studies. And even Jung and Forster uh, called it non-lexical memory and uh, uh, Tulving himself, who is uh, behind this construct of uh, episodic memory, uh, called uh, in, in, in those types of studies, uh, called it uh, episodic-like memory uh, 30 years later. Uh, so, according to this hypothesis, again, uh, and this is a very a strong claim, L1 and L2 words are stored in different memory systems permanently, so they cannot activate each other cross-linguistically. Uh, and uh, there is some evidence in support of that. Uh, there is some counter evidence uh, in support of that, but if we look uh, at uh, the complementary learning systems approach that uh, tells us that uh, um, you know uh, initial episodic memories are formed in the hippocampus. Uh, this is where uh, new memory information is stored, and then uh, not yet. And then uh, once uh, those uh, memories are consolidated, they are pushed into neocortex uh, uh, and they're all already tightly packaged uh, and nice uh, and uh, well encoded. Uh, then uh, according to the complementary learning systems approach and uh, this quote is uh, not a random quote, this is a review of uh, the complementary learning systems by Lins and Gaskell, specifically for L2 learners, uh, because it's, it is massively uh, applied in uh, um, just monolingual studies, but uh, it, it is also explored in uh, second language studies. So the idea is that uh, this uh, encoding and consolidation of uh, uh, lexical representations uh, takes place in the hippocampus, but then they have, uh, and uh, sleep uh, is uh, the time when uh, this process is very active, though uh, there are uh, several studies that show that sleep is sufficient, but sleep is not absolutely needed. You can organize your training in such a way that uh, uh, this consolidation uh, takes place without sleep. And so uh, eventually uh, those episodic uh, memories uh, turn into um, those tightly packaged uh, representations that are stored uh, in the neocortex in, uh, uh, in long-term memory. And uh, so uh, the idea that uh, L2 uh, learners uh, use hippocampus and episodic memory for all the words that they know, uh, you know, whether they are old or new uh, in their learning experience, uh, whether they are uh, um, beginning speakers or very, very advanced speakers, that uh, is, something that beats common sense a little bit. Uh, but it would have been easy to reject it just based on common sense. But there are different sources of evidence that show that indeed episodic memory plays a different role 
in uh, uh, non-native speakers. And I'm referring here to recognition memory tasks where um, participants learn word lists in their L1 and L2 and I later tested them how well they remember uh, those words. And this is a purely episodic task. Uh, and uh, they are more accurate in uh, recognizing studied words than monolinguals and more accurate in their less proficient L2 than in the L1. So there is something to it. Indeed, L2 learners uh, rely on their uh, episodic memory in different ways than native speakers. And they're also less prone to developing false memories for semantic lures. So for example, uh, if you studied a list that includes thread, pin, eye, and uh, sewing, uh bilinguals uh will be very careful and uh, when they encounter uh the critical lure needle they will say it was not on the list uh unlike uh, uh native speakers and uh, in uh, the l2 they will accept this lure less likely uh, uh, than in the L1. So this is a very interesting pattern. So where does it leave us? It looks like, and this is super speculative. Now I'm starting to wave my hands right before we stop. And you take it with a grain of, of salt, but I think it's a good grounds for future discussions. And I'm hoping for uh, future research uh, in uh, um, that would uh, kind of disentangle those two approaches uh, or merge them, uh, which is also a possibility. So it looks like indeed L2 speakers deal with the multiple encoding problems. Um, and of course, uh, there is ample evidence of their uh, phonological categorization problems. There is also evidence of form meaning mapping uh, encoding uh, and also semantic encoding that I uh, didn't get to show you. Um, this is the work of Denisa Bordek and her collaborators, several interesting uh, three papers uh, on that topic. And indeed, it looks like maybe as a consequence of that, L2 speakers tend to rely more on recently formed episodic representations as a compensatory mechanism, maybe. Uh, so uh, they kind of make use of the, those raw uh, acoustic phonetic representations and patchy representations of meaning, uh, raw meaning not tightly packaged um, consolidated representations that uh, um, uh, this uh, hippocampal activity usually generates. Uh, and uh, when they finally encode words in long-term memory, on the other hand, those long-term lexical representations are fuzzy. They're not properly encoded for all the reasons that we have discussed before. And in, uh, in experimental situations, they may show the properties of episodic representations uh, because they're not well integrated with the, with the lexical networks and so on and so forth. So from two perspectives, you could see this uh, 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 kind of convergence between the two positions on two different grounds, but with a lot of uh, caveats, because uh, it may be that fuzzy representations of less familiar words in L2 uh, behave like episodic representations and uh, they are they are just uh, this is uh, epiphenomenal and finally to get us back to where we started uh, indeed uh, you know those um, ra round shapes uh, it is clear that uh, they are uh, 
very closely interrelated, but it may be the case that uh, in a larger picture, we should build a model that would include puzzle lexical representations and uh, episodic memory in, uh, in one model. And thank you very much for your patience. And I'm ready to answer questions. Questions, I don't know how you, what formats you use, but uh, I will be happy to take them in Russian, in, uh, uh, in English, um, in French. Uh, um, you can use whatever the format is accepted uh, in, in the conference. Thank you very much. Thank you for your patience, especially. Thank you very much, Kira, for such an informative uh, talk with so many facts. Uh, so yes, we have some time for questions. We prefer them to be in English since the working language is English. And um, yes, please, you can raise your hand or... Yep, we have one question from Yekaterina Stankova. Please go ahead. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Uh, when you were speaking about uh, phonological allophones, you told that uh, Chinese learners of English with less variability, um, allophonic use in their native language have had some advantage to, uh, to distinguish uh, phonological allophones in English. Yes, that's correct. Uh, but can you clarify why this is happening? It, it is now clear for me. Okay, thank you for asking the question. Indeed, I didn't get to clarify it. I started rushing through. Um, just think about uh, two possible pronunciations of the same word that are used interchangeably. Uh, imagine, uh, I don't want to go to examples such as galosha, kalosha, because there apparently you have not two elephones, but two phonemes that are used interchangeably, but they refer still to the same lexical item. Uh, but uh, the situation in Chinese is such that you can use either one elephone or the other, and they will still be encoded as one phoneme, and this phoneme will encode the same lexical item eventually. So this fact that they're used interchangeably means that they're consistently encoded as one phoneme and, uh, in, uh, uh, in Chinese. And this kind of, um, this is the underlying mechanism for all types of, uh, uh, encoding, you know, uh, when we encode any uh, sound sequence, they're all different. Acoustically, they're different. Phonetically, they're different. But our goal is to decide what is it. So they are used to deciding that uh, whether it's v or w, it's still w. And that's what, <laughs> so when it gets to English, instead of having an advantage with this flexibility, they're having a disadvantage of consistently uh, mapping them to only what in their native language. Did I answer your question? Uh, yes, I get it, thanks. Okay, uh, at least that's our thinking today. <laughs> but uh, I, um, as, as, a, as a phonetician in my uh, past life, I think that this, may, this makes sense. And this does not say anything about, as I say, uh, the elephones that are in complementary distribution. That has to be studied separately because there the type of encoding uh, will be different. Thank you. All right, any more questions? Yes, we have a question from Yuri Shterov. Yes, thank you very much, Kira, for uh, an overarching uh, talk. Uh, 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 certainly the notion of um, fuzziness in L2 lexical representation seems to be sort of 
very logical and anyone who's done who's done some learning of other languages knows how fuzzy these representations often are, particularly at first. My question to you still is whether there are any similar uh, phenomena you could see in L1. Are these mechanisms actually, you know, L2 or L3 specific, or is this something more universal, the fuzziness of uh, representations as you form them? Thank you very much, Yuri, because uh, we do think a, lo a lot about it. I personally do. And uh, if you want, let me uh, start with a larger framework. When people say that L2 speakers have radically different mechanisms in uh, language processing, language learning, I don't believe it. You know, our brains are wired, uh, generally speaking, in the same way. It is just the way we rely on different mechanisms, uh, depending on the context of learning and depending on whether it's uh, our first and second language, uh, depending on when it happens in our life or early or late. So to go back to your question directly, I'm pretty sure that this same fuzziness exists in a native language uh, for all the less familiar words. And I can think of lots of examples, like, you know, think of COVID, how many, uh, I don't know, uh, in, in, <laughs> in the Russian context, in the English context, all those new potentially miracle medications that are out there. Can I spell out the names? <laughs> yes, I've read them several times. Zap up something. <laughs> They are not properly encoded, though I know um, that some of them work on boosting the immune system and others are working, you know, to, you know, mitigate uh, the, actually the uh, hyperactive response uh, uh, of the immune system. I cannot spell them out. On the other hand, you know, since I lost my uh, close connection to the classical uh, Russian literature. I haven't taught it in one zillion years. I'm and I don't use this vocabulary on a daily basis. I find myself uh, running into words that have to deal with the practice of hunting, for example. You know, take the you know the descriptions of hunting in the classical Russian literature. I, st I, I know the word belongs to this domain. I know that it is about dogs. I cannot tell exactly what it means or about horses or about sailing. Things that I'm not familiar with in my life that I, you know, I had a pretty uh, clear idea of what they meant. Now it is a word with a semantic field, but not a, a semantic reference. Does it make sense to you? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. So, same experience, obviously. Perhaps the extra layer of complexity for uh, foreign languages comes from phonology. So, whereas in native language, you can comfortably, comfortably handle. Uh, phonology without uh, having full semantic representation, but you just get extra complication in the case like where you show it for Catalan or uh, Chinese learners. Right, but then you also remember that uh, uh, second language learners are a little bit uh, like child uh, monolinguals. They are being stretched and they, they have to do a lot of uh, guessing from the context that is not within their linguistic range. <laughs> so um, they are slowed down because of phonology, but they also slowed down because they encounter words and context that would be fully transparent for a native speaker, but are only 50% transparent for them. So they are <laughs> doing much more second guessing. And right. uh, here I'm talking about four meaning mappings and developing semantic representations. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, could, I have, could I have a question? Oh, yes, sure. Yes, um, great talk. Thank you. I, I was actually struck by the terminology and I was thinking as a memory researcher, not lang I have no idea anything about language at all. But as a memory researcher, so fuzzy trace theory, of course, is a major theory in memory research. 
But I think the predictions would actually be the reverse from what you're referring to when you talk about L2 representation. So fuzzy trace theory would predict actually more false memories when you have a fuzzy trace uh, in a list learning task such as um, the um, uh, Rodder um, McDermott lists. Uh, because you would be retrieving based on the gist representation as opposed to the episodic representation. The findings that you present show that L2 actually seem to be refer relying more on the more refined or more accurate representation as opposed to the gist representation. So I'm wondering if you could clarify um, these sort of I guess, at least on the surface, they seem to be contradictory in, in the sense of how people are using the word fuzzy in linguistics as opposed to memory. Thank you very much. You are uh, <laughs> uh, aiming at the core of the whole uh, very fuzzy issue at this point. So let me backtrack and I will be uh, trying to figure out as we go. Uh, the idea is that we are observing, uh, I would say, pretty massive evidence of uh, those fuzzy representations. And we are talking about long-term memory. And we are talking about words that are not properly encoded. And uh, I'm really uh, uh, very... Uh, kind of uh, timid talking to a memory specialist, but <laughs> I'll still give it a try. Uh, most of the research that shows that uh, L2 learners are actually better at episodic memories, uh, they are indeed about recently formed episodic memories. And there is a huge gap between how words are encoded and are sitting there in, in long-term memory of a second language learner who has studied the language for 10 years, as opposed to studying a list of words that was presented uh, five minutes ago. Uh, there, there is no question they are relying on episodic memory. And there, we're definitely seeing an, an advantage. So in episodic, at the stage of episodic memory, they are sharper. They are, more, they are not making those mistakes. One of the reasons why maybe is that, uh, you know, there is this idea of salience uh, of, a, of a word, of a stimulus, depending on how familiar it is. And we, we know that, um, you know, low frequency, items are more salient. It's easier to remember them uh, in a, in a, uh, whether they are on the list or not in an episodic memory task. It's um, easier to remember them from a linguistic experiment. Uh, so with this in mind, uh, because uh, you know the probabilities uh, and this, uh, the salience is skewed in second language learners, uh, non-native words are more salient for them, if you want. They are, they are, they are you know, exotic, they are new, they are not well assimilated. So that would explain why they're dealing better. Uh, another approach would be to think in terms of uh, lexical networks. So uh, if, if a word is not very well assimilated, it is not part of a semantic network or a phonological network. And uh, with this in mind, you know, uh, I think that uh, 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 native speakers, when they hear uh, sewing and uh, uh, needle and stuff, uh, they create this semantic field and uh, uh, the new word fits so well into the semantic fields that they are willing to accept it as an old word. Uh, but uh, because those semantic networks are not very strong for L2 learners, they're not willing to admit it. And maybe they didn't activate the whole network as efficiently as native speakers did. Does it make sense at all? 
Yeah, it does. I'm just, I mean, for me then what you're doing, and I actually totally agree with that, is you're taking the word fuzzy and you apply it to a semantic network. Whereas in the memory research, they use the word fuzzy as intrusions into the episodic memory network or processes, I don't know, depending on which camp you're in, I guess. Um, and so I think it's important for, well, for you, especially if you want to talk to memory researchers, to distinguish, to, to be more specific about what you mean by fuzzy, uh, which is poorly integrated semantic representations, as opposed to a poorly formed episodic representation. These are two very different uh, meanings of the word fuzzy that you and people who do uh, episodic memory research are using the same word to describe very different cognitive underlying mechanisms, I think. I'm super grateful to you for this uh, comment because uh, let me tell you, we were using uh, the, word, uh, the term fuzzy carelessly for years and it only dawned on me uh, very recently that we need to build bridges with the episodic memory. And then, of course, I realized that uh, the fuzzy trace uh, hypothesis is already there and fuzzy is already, uh, you know, <laughs> locked in for another use. So we, indeed, we need to sort this out. And thank you very much again for pointing it because otherwise, yeah, memory people will laugh at us and say, well, we, <laughs> we know what fuzzy means. No, they won't. They'll just try to understand better. Yeah, thank you. I would also like to ask a clarification question about the terminology. Uh, so this term fuzzy uh, representations are they really fuzzy or rather multiple or even stochastic? Because what I mean is that, let's say we have a, a L2 learner and he or she has a many phonological or lexical representations of a language item uh, equally weak and equally inaccurate. So when he or she has to recognize a word or a phoneme or something else or a grapheme uh, in L2, what is necessary to do just to hypothesize quickly to test like was it this one or that one or that one and decide between all of them so it's a more like probabilistic process or not thank you very much a very uh, <laughs> a very deep question uh, uh and uh, I, i'm not sure i, I will have a, a satisfying answer for you but um from what we have been observing in uh, L2 learners, and uh, I didn't get a chance to show you the data on uh, the uh, um, semantic substitutions, how they cannot figure out what word means what. Um, and for example, they hear krelco, uh, and they translate it as wing, krelo. Uh, mm. Just because they uh, somehow they uh, they overlap uh, phonologically and semantically are not very distinct. But the whole idea, uh, uh, the the whole uh, set of observations that uh, in uh, uh, phonological priming, um, L two learners show facilitation instead of inhibition. This is, you know, if, if we just stay within um, the realm of established truths, we believe that there is some competition between the prime and the target. We also believe that there may be uh, activation and uh, competition with those neighbors. Uh, and we're not um, getting committed to any um, particular model now, whether the lateral inhibition takes place or not, this is not relevant. What is relevant is that if there is competition, there should be inhibition. If there is facilitation, then this competition is weak. Otherwise, the whole kind of approach falls apart. And this is our assumption that those representations are weak because because they're fuzzy, because they're not very distinct one from the other. They cannot compete with each other because I cannot even tell which one is what. So how, do, how, how the, does this mechanism of competition work? Does it make sense at all? 
Yes, I get the idea, yeah. Thank you. And sorry, it didn't ask, answer your question directly, but you see, we are, we're still um, at uh, a very early stage uh, and uh, we are, what we're doing is we're making a quilt, you know, patchwork, you know, little pieces of evidence here and there. And there is, this is a fundamental question that should be researched separately. Indeed, it is. And I hope this research topic in Frontiers will enhance the whole area. Well, we have very good people who signed up and uh, I, have a, I have a suspicion, I don't want to, to go on record, but I have a suspicion that maybe some people in the editorial board who suggested the topic, they kind of were on the low start, like we, <laughs> we have things to show too. <laughs> give us the topic. Good. Uh, we have actually one more commentary. Um, in our chat from Richard Shilcock, I will read it aloud. I think FASI has positive implications with respect to the distinction between fine coding and coarse coding. Both types of coding can be adaptive in certain processing circumstances and have hemispheric allegiances. Uh, yes, thank you very much for, for this comment. And uh, um, yes, I'm thinking in terms of uh, um, you know, the model of reading with a coarse grained and fine grained, uh, um, you know, types of uh, reading. Uh, there is certainly a, um, you know, a broader agenda behind the, this dichotomy. Um, this is something really I haven't thought about, but it's, it's very, it's very uh, kind of uh, relevant for, um, kind of mapping out uh, the territory uh, because it is not obvious that coarse grained encoding will be easier if there are problems with encoding, depending on what you're talking about. Uh, yes, indeed, if you go back to uh, this uh, uh, construct of uh, coarse grained and uh, fine grained, uh, reading approaches um, developed by Granger, say, uh, it could make sense that, you know, a fuzzy representation, visual representation of a word would have this uh, coarse grained uh, encoding where you have a T somewhere in the beginning and an L somewhere in the middle. And that would, that would make sense. Uh, so, um, I just don't know how to run a tighter experiment because it will probably be very easy to show that all those, um, all the fuzziness in, in the encoding uh, has to do with the not being able to reproduce the exact sequence as opposed to say that those letters were there in the word. But then uh, if you take it one step further, uh, what I think will be happening um, in, uh, in skilled readers, for example, uh, you know, even if they uh, rely on uh, coarse grained encoding, they will also plug in their general knowledge about morphological structure. Uh, you know, if you have uh, ED somewhere uh, at the end of the word and it's an English word and you think it's a verb, maybe it was a past tense, so you start uh, working through a lot of uh, parallel hypotheses, or maybe you will activate all the roots with the, with the, mm, you know, something like uh, quarrel and squirrel, you know, uh, you will just uh, think of, of the roots that have those weird occurrences of letters. And that will be a path to, to recreating the word. Uh, but of course, um, I, I totally agree that uh, fine grained is probably uh, a little bit out of reach for beginning L2 learners. Does it make sense at all? Oh, he, he asked the question in the written form. It was in written form. Okay. So I hope it was a- Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm not getting feedback because <laughs> we could probably have a, you know, a little bit of a discussion, but uh, 
at least I, uh, that's my first take on it. We are having a discussion and I'm just looking yeah. whether we have any more questions and looks like there are no more. And way over the time limit. Uh, well, we are slightly uh, later than we expected to finish, but I think that's fine. We are here just to discuss interesting things and we are not doing this so often, just once a year. And <laughs> this year it costed a lot of efforts for uh, you to join us from a different time zone. I just hope it was not too early for you. Oh, no, 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 not at all, not at all. You, you, you were so accommodating. Thank you so much. No, that, that was not an issue. I was just going to say, uh, why do it once a year? You know, once you figure out the logistical um, aspects of uh, Zooming, <laughs> it does the matter of... <laughs> well, we still keep hoping that all this COVID stuff will end soon. But to be honest, the further we go, the weaker the hopes are so who knows maybe the next nbsl meeting will be in the same online format but touch wood <laughs> exactly. no one is brave enough these days to make any i don't know expectations any pronounced uh, well we uh, uh, in the united states we have a a guru dr fauci who pronounces himself uh uh, on you know he 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 provides guidance. He is the director of one uh, of the one of the institutes uh, in the National Institutes of Health um, that has to do with the um, uh, infectious diseases. And everybody listens to Dr. Fauci, uh, and some people hate him. And um, they they were they were protests saying fire Fauci because he says we need to wear masks and so on and so forth. So uh, from uh, a colleague, an insider who works at uh, the NIH, uh, in uh, in his conversations with the director of NIH, he says the end of twenty twenty two. Uh, is now the target. <laughs> well, the target. unfortunately, it sounds realistic. And yeah. okay, uh, didn't want us to finish uh, <laughs> at this point. <laughs> so thank you very much for such a really comprehensive uh, uh, keynote on such a rare uh, emerging topic and really looking forward for new results, new data and new discussions and always happy to host you and this is already the second time we are having Kira as a member of the conference and this is a great honor so I think it's probably time for us to slowly finish this day it was very rich and very intense just want to say great thank you to everyone who participated and we are just posing uh, tomorrow we start at 11 uh, we have another two slide sessions and one more flash talks session, which was pretty successful uh, today when we just tried this format. And then in the evening, we have another third keynote talk by Dr. Olga Dragoy from Higher School of Economics. So uh, please come and uh, I think it's gonna be very inspiring and enriching. And don't forget to wear masks and stay safe. Uh, Yuri, would you like to say something else? No. Not really. I think we'd like to thank all the presenters and the audience today and looking forward to seeing you again tomorrow, tomorrow morning. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so keep much. in touch. Keep in touch. So see you tomorrow. And Kiros, thank you once again very much. And it was a great pleasure. Yeah, it was a great pleasure for me. And you listed all the good things that uh, my talk uh, may engender. Uh, you missed just one piece. We will also produce some research on <laughs> fuzzy representations. <laughs> this is the whole, uh, you know, the whole uh, <laughs> idea. No, I'm not, I'm not, um, you know, that uh, charged, you know, to, to say that everybody has to do it. But I, I think that with your research on, uh, um, uh, um, what is it, fast, fast it's mapping fast mapping, I think this is where we can intersect because 
uh, it is about a different type of... Uh, I do agree. I do agree. And I do hope that next in BSL, whether it's next year or in a shorter time, uh, we can learn about what is there on those hidden slides that we had to skip today and Right. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Everybody have a great evening and see you tomorrow. And thank you very much. Thank you very much. See you.